welcome to Apogee Up Close webcast series. Today we'll be uh, discussing a topic that is uh, very popular today, and we'll have an opportunity to do a Q and Q and A at the end of the webcast. So, let me introduce myself. My name is Joey Wong. I'm the customer engineer uh, for Apogee, which is a part of Google Cloud. And with me, I have. I am Sarthak. I'm a partner engineer for Google Cloud Platform. And interestingly, I um, I was part of Apigee until last year, so I have seen both sides of the world. And we are joining in from not sunny and but cold New York. <laughs> it, it is certainly getting colder. Um, so today we'll actually be discussing a couple of items, and really it's about how organizations are actually embarking on a journey and transition from a traditionally on-premise um, to a hybrid IT architecture and some of those challenges that are faced in that journey itself. We'll also present how Apigee can help do risk in some cases accelerate application modernization and migration by introducing an API management layer to broker transactions between legacy backend systems and cloud services. So join us as we share how we can help uh, you make that move to the cloud. So before we get down into the details itself, um, interestingly enough, Google itself conducts a survey with our customers and our CI uh, customer CIOs. You know, some of the biggest questions are, are they currently using a multi-cloud strategy? And based on that survey, uh, the response has, has been very eye-opening. Based on the survey itself, 96% of the CIOs and the customers that we actually talked to today have actually uh, either deployed or are working on deploying or are thinking seriously about a multi-cloud strategy. And the reasons for these are you know, a number of, number of uh, key points, really. It's really about empowering the organization to mix and match uh, solutions and to be able to leverage innovative technologies from the different cloud providers themselves. Every single one of our customers have some unique requirements, which then need, they need to then tailor their solutions based uh, on those requirements. And additionally, it's really to increase you know, redundancy and avoid downtime and to ensure that their business is highly available and also scalable. And we see this a lot in our financial services customers and also our healthcare customers as well. So as our customers are actually embarking on this journey to cloud, uh, there are multiple ways of migration. It's not a single path to cloud. And um, you know, when we have a look at it, when they start with legacy on-premise, there are actually a number of options that they can take. They can modernize on-premise, where they can start taking some of those applications that are monolith applications, whether they're commercially uh, off-the-shelf sort of applications or something that they've built in-house, and start breaking down into um, you know, smaller uh, microservices and taking that microservices architecture approach. When they do that, they also have the ability to then take those modernized applications, microservices and whatnot, and then move to the cloud. Now, not every single application can be broken down into microservices. So one of the strategies that our customers uh, take is the lift and shift, where they take existing monolith applications and then move it into the cloud itself. Now, that doesn't necessarily bring all the advantages of cloud naturally, but it does reduce you know, operational overhead. It does reduce the cost of having to procure new hardware. It does reduce the need to keep up with upgrade cycles, you know, patching up the OS and whatnot. Um, so there are some advantages of just doing lift and shift. And interestingly enough, it's never just you know, one way, which is modernize on-prem and then move to cloud, or lift and shift and then move to the cloud and then modernize. It's usually somewhere in between where you know, within the same uh, company, even within the same organization, they actually do both. Where they start modernizing on-prem and also start lifting and shifting certain workloads into the cloud. For folks that aren't familiar with Apigee, Apigee is an API management platform which provides the ability for you to create API proxies and facades which sit in front of your backend systems, such as you know, cloud applications, uh, legacy on-premise applications, commercially off-the-shelf applications uh, that have been traditionally deployed uh, on-premise. Now, when we create that facade through Apigee, you get a number of uh, 
you know, capabilities such as security, uh, analytics, and visibility into who is actually now calling into those uh, APIs and backend systems. You have the ability to publish those APIs into the developer portal um, for internal and external consumption, thereby, you know, uh, creating an additional channel for consumption for your business. Now, the benefit of being able to do this is your applications that consume your APIs do not need to know where those APIs are actually implemented, whether they're on-premise, in the cloud, application A, application B, or even versions of those same applications itself. This is very powerful as it helps our customers you know, create an ability to then uh, plan what they want to move and modernize into the cloud itself. So let's take a look at you know, an example of this. Today, you might start off with an on-premise uh, data center where you have existing workloads itself. You can now leverage Google Cloud Platform to either um, build new greenfield applications or even to ex even experiment, right? You can start with non-production workloads or even start looking at things like cloud bursting where you use Google Cloud to supplement your on-premise uh, resources. As you get comfortable with Google Cloud Platform, we can then start doing things like lift and shift as we saw in the previous slides where we take those existing on-premise applications and then deploy them onto Google Cloud itself using something like Google Compute Engine. The other strategy, which was to modernize in place, so breaking down existing applications into microservices and leveraging things like Kubernetes on-premise, where you have now you know, created these microservices, which can then be deployed into Kubernetes, which can then be scaled automatically through Kubernetes, Kubernetes itself. With those modernized microservices that have been deployed or developed on Kubernetes itself, we can then easily migrate them to Google Cloud Platform and more specifically into Google Kubernetes Engine and GKE. So at the end of the day, you know, all these efforts are really for the applications at the front end consuming the APIs itself. So where we see API management helping is sitting between the two um, infrastructures, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, which then provides that facade and protects the consumers from needing to know specifically where they need to consume the APIs from. So with that, what are some of the challenges that our customers uh, are actually experiencing when they think about modernization and migration to the cloud itself? Um, they think about business continuity, right? As they move applications to the cloud, they should not cause any outage or disruption to their existing customers. And this can be customers from internal and could be customers from an external point of view. They also need to consider security because data in, you know, inherently will live in multiple places and be accessed uh, in multiple places as well. You don't want to be compromised or you know, leave APIs open for consumption without any control or visibility, which brings us to visibility. Without an API management layer, it becomes very difficult to understand you know, who your consumers are, be able to control which applications are actually consuming those APIs and understand are they consuming them in a fashion that you actually want them to. And then interoperability as well. As you lift and shift certain applications, uh, you want to maintain you know, applications that are traditionally more familiar with things like SOAP web services and continue to be able to offer those things up in an easy and uh, consumable fashion itself. And lastly, you want to be able to handle unmanaged services. You know, traditionally, as you build out microservices or applications itself, how do you actually understand you know, those, those consumptions of those services themselves? Without some sort of visibility, without some sort of API management layer, it becomes very difficult as you scale out. So how can Apogee help? So in terms of service connectivity and helping business continuity, we can create that abstraction layer between GCP and also on-premise itself. We can create that abstraction layer between you know, legacy application and modernized applications themselves. We hide the complexity of the application migration uh, because your consumers no longer need to know where those new services or legacy services live. They can continue to consume the way that they used to. 
Um, with API management, you now have the ability to also enforce security consistently across all your APIs. You can also use Apigee to facilitate things like mediation between security protocols. And that's something that we'll discuss with a particular customer use case uh, in, a, in a couple more minutes. Uh, we get great visibility because now all traffic is being proxied through Apigee itself. We capture every aspect of that API transaction, where the API transaction has been called from, which application, how often they're actually consuming the APIs, and you know what sort of performance and error rates they're actually seeing. This gives you a great visibility into understanding your API program and also be able to improve, um, extend your API program itself. We give you API facades where you can modernize legacy uh, SOAP applications, turn them into new API RESTful, RESTful APIs, and also you know, give you consistency across the board. And lastly, uh, service management across all your microservices or even your traditional uh, legacy applications, where you now have a single platform where you can enforce policies across the board, across all those different services, and then be able to manage it in a single uh, pane of glass. What are the solution's benefits uh, in terms of being able to leverage Apigee in this uh, particular use case? Is that you're reducing the risk of app migration and modernization by creating an API facade. You have the ability to provide a consistent API across the board for both you know, modernized services and legacy services itself. At the same time, you can then start leveraging um, you know, innovative technologies in the cloud. So start innovating on GCP by leveraging things like GKE, AI, ML, etc. Where those services sit shouldn't matter to the API consumers themselves or the applications. Apigee will now mediate and make sure that it is routed to the appropriate endpoints. So with that, I would like to uh, start talking about a specific customer use case. And um, Sartek was actually involved with a particular customer that actually embarked on this particular journey. So with that, Sartek, do you want to introduce the actual use case itself? Yeah, absolutely. So this is something I think I worked on maybe a um, year or so ago, maybe a little bit more than that at this stage uh, when we started first working on this. So it's a retail customer um, who has, as you can imagine, a very standard legacy on-prem data center. And like many other customers who were looking at that stage, how can they modernize their stack? How can they uh, be more cloud friendly, take care of capabilities like uh, cloud bursting and horizontal scalability and things like that? So when we first started talking to them, this is how major portion of the stack looked like. So they had this whole huge uh, legacy on-prem e-commerce software, which was a huge monolith, which had all the capabilities from the customer management system to, to search, to shopping cart, everything built in. And then uh, there were, as part of the same solution, they had a bunch of applications like web apps, mobile apps, and whatnot, uh, which would then consume uh, those services on the back end via APIs. Keep in mind here, both the front end and the back end were part of the same solution suite. Uh, so this was, the, this was the current state from where we, we started our conversation from. And what were the challenges the customers uh, facing and what were they trying to solve, I guess, from this <coughs> state itself? So uh, I think there were uh, two uh, challenges. One was I think that's a pain point which they had for a long time, which was uh, the front end and the back end was very tightly coupled. Uh, and uh, so the thing was like the front end, they have a very different pace of innovation. They have a very different technology stack. There's a very different mindset of the developers who are working on an iOS app versus someone who is working on the shopping carts uh, e-commerce system. So there was a friction for a long time about all of that. Like the, the front end guys, they were not able to innovate faster, fixing bugs faster, they did not have enough flexibility. Um, and it was, and there was a constant tension across, across these different teams, which had been brewing for many, many years, right? And, uh, but I, I don't think that was kind of the tipping point. Uh, their tipping point was, for various reasons, a uh, few years back, they started, a couple of years back, I think, they started seriously considering cloud, and they wanted to go to cloud because things like they wanted to do horizontal scalability for the peak days, like 
uh, Black Fridays and whatnot, and not over provision capacity for year round. So once they started looking at that, then this uh, this very tightly coupled monolithic architecture became a real problem. That uh, I think that was the first uh, tipping point that hey, we need to do something about this architecture if we have to actually embark on this cloud journey. So. So in effect, there were two parts of it, right? One was the agility and yeah. be able to innovate quickly. And that was being... Uh, Correct. Because it was based on an old model of architecture, it was becoming very difficult for the applications to do so. Right. And I think the second one that you mentioned was around the scalability, right? Scalability yeah. as well as all the other benefits which cloud provides, mm -hmm. once they wanted to kind of um, you know, take advantage of that, then this became a problem. Right. Scalability, the horizontal scalability, so that no over provisioning, mm -hmm. on demand scalability, all the added security which they get uh, in cloud, all those things became a problem. So, how did they actually begin their journey? So, one of the first things they did was they inserted Apigee, and uh, in between those client and the and the backend. So, Apigee is a is a facade, as Joey mentioned previously. So, their idea was that we already have those APIs. Why is how to decouple them? Insert Apigee in, create this facade, and now suddenly there is uh, there is an abstraction between what the clients are consuming, the client applications are consuming, and what the backend is producing. So now what they can do is they can change the backend, and then inside the Apigee layer they can transform the the payloads, the the security protocols, the error codes, and all those things to match to what the client applications actually actually are looking for. So now Apigee becomes a flexibility or the agility layer, if you may, be using which they decouple that front-end applications or the back-end, this huge monolith. Awesome. And then what are what other things uh, did Apigee provide? Seeing as we're now proxying the traffic between the application and the yeah. token system, you know, was analytics something that was important? To yeah, exactly, right? So because once you insert Apigee in and once you start having all those API calls, one of the first things they did was uh, they looked at the analytics. And as, the, as a lot of Apigee customers do, because using analytics, they could first, for the first time, they could see which one of the services, which one of the APIs are getting called, at what frequency, what can be considered as a as a low time, downtime to move some something over, uh, which APIs have the most problem in terms of which is taking the most highest latency, mm -hmm. which has the error rates uh, being higher, which has, you know, all those kind of metrics. And based on that, they decided their whole, whole business journey that which of those services can be migrated when. And, and so essentially that journey started from a deep look at analytics and it took many, many weeks when they created many custom reports and, and and looked at many of the standard reports, which Apigee provides to understand all those aspects from error rates, latency, uh, traffic patterns, how does it vary by geography, how is it varying by different uh, different clients, like how is it varying by Android versus iOS versus web. All those things, once they looked at it, that's what helped them decide how they can migrate something to cloud. So even just by simply putting Apigee as the facade layer, as the proxy between the API requests, uh, the customer was able to get deep analytics insight and yeah. then use that to help them plan the path to cloud. Exactly. The next step, obviously, was then to start breaking down some of those uh, capabilities. Yeah, and that was the whole idea, right? So mm -hmm. what they wanted to do is they wanted to uh, they wanted to refactor this monolith. They wanted to get out of the monolith and take some of those individual services and put them in GCP, in Google Cloud Platform. So in this case, you can see that they have done that with search, but you will see the search is also on-prem because in this stage, I'm, I'm showing the scenario when they were just in the middle of transitioning, right? So they have, let's say, refactored the whole service, they're running that on, on GCP, a brand new service, but the legacy service is still running on-prem. Now they're using Apigee kind of to first and foremost facilitate almost like a blue-green deployment, so that they, they route some traffic to GCP, some traffic to on-prem, and then at a, some stage when they're confident that the cloud um, service, the refactor service is good enough, that's when they migrate, uh, or that's where they route all those API calls to uh, GCP instead of routing them to on-prem. 
but also you can see the other beauty is now they can break out an individual service out of the monolith. Hmm. And the client applications, they don't see the impact. And that's the biggest benefit. So the client applications, the guys who are writing, who specialize in Angular JS and writing those web apps, mm -hmm. he doesn't see all these changes happening behind the scenes. For him, those clients, this is completely transferred. Now, as they move to GCP, and uh, they they build this thing in Google uh, Kubernetes engine, all microservices. They are writing new uh, new standards of the API, so everything is JSON over REST, and all those and new security standards. And and then Apigee is transforming all of that to the legacy or to the or to the standard which the client applications um, expect to see. Right. So that's the biggest advantage. That as you start moving, Apigee acts as a blue grid deployment. Uh, a facilitator, if you may, and then you know uh, it provides all that flexibility and to uh, and to basically bring together the legacy interface and the and the modern interface together. Awesome. So as they progress, they would then you know start deprecating certain things on premise. So by removing say search from their on premise, Correct. right, and then start looking again using things like analytics to understand. What would be a good candidate to move into 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 cloud? Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly, right. Mm -hmm. And and I mean now in this case we can see that in this scenario uh, they had a couple of services uh, in the cloud and some services on prem, but the front end applications they they don't see all that movement happening behind the scenes. And the beauty is what we actually saw since are now the front end developers they have more flexibility. Instead of actually slowing down, they can actually went ahead and they created new apps on the front end. Because now they know that, oh, this is my API definition. And this is the API definition against which I'm building everything. And this API definition is not going to change every time some small thing changes on the back end. Mm. Previously, that was a big challenge, right? If if they do an upgrade of any of the services or, or of that e-commerce platform or, or they did anything, there was a big probability that the front-end apps will, will break. And that's where the front-end developers spent a lot of time to make sure when all the back-end things changes, their things did not break. So by creating an API-first strategy, that yeah. gave uh, the customer an ability to innovate and create new APIs and services and then be able to implement them using whatever technology they choose And the to. new apps. Yeah. I mean, uh, they were kind of stuck at having those like Android and iOS apps that are pretty legacy technology for a while mm -hmm. because they just did not have time other than, uh, other than firefighting, other than to comply with the backend because it's the same engine at the end of the day which is supporting their stores as well as their e-commerce engine. So there were requirements for all sides which will shape that backend, mm -hmm. which the front-end guys had no control on. They would always be in a reactionary mode, so that left their uh, mobile apps and the web apps in a pretty dire state. Um, it was pretty legacy technology. They did not have like native um, Android app, and mm -hmm. uh, there were a need for a couple of other web applications, like for the B2B scenarios and things like that. So finally, while all this backend kind of mayhem, if you may, is going on, that's when they were able to, you know, uh, roll up their sleeves and, and build some new applications and, and, and improve and modernize the existing applications. Awesome. And then inherently, you know, a question that always comes up is by introducing another layer is, what, you know, what sort of uh, performance challenges, or if any, were kind of faced? Uh, are you talking in terms of, like, latency? Yeah, latency. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't think we showed here, but as you can imagine with the retail, there are a lot of services like um, like catalogs and uh, like customer data and their store loyalty locations. program and store location yeah. and all of that data. Uh, all those things are cacheable, and Apigee has a very powerful caching layer with level one and level two cache built in. Wherever that was possible, uh, they actually used the Apigee cache, and that actually reduced the latency quite drastically. Now, in some other cases, which are like, uh, uh, which are which cannot be cached, which are real time, for example, mm -hmm. the actual shopping cart, um, or, or let's say recommendation, because recommendations constantly change. Um, those things, whether there was a latency ad, yeah, maybe, mm -hmm. right? But keep in mind, like in those cases, we are looking at APIs which were taking few seconds mm -hmm. from the app to the back end to do all the stuff and go back. And then Apigee's latency ad was like single digit milliseconds, right? right. Or double digit milliseconds. Mm -hmm. 
right? So like 20, 30 milliseconds in that range. And given the amount of benefits which we are getting, hmm. like a 30 millisecond bump compared to a three second uh, was, was not considered much. Yeah. And obviously there were a huge set of APIs, huge set of services for which there was a huge, huge performance bump wherever they could mm-hmm. uh, use the caching policy which is built in. Uh, one other thing I might add is, though it might not look obvious, like as you are going through the journey, mm-hmm. we started off with a lot of heavy APIs, which were SOAP, which were XML. And as we are going through the journey, the APIs were, were a lot lighter. Mm-hmm. They were like they were they were JSON over REST. We are lighting lightweight microservices. Mm-hmm. So as part of the overall journey, the the round trip of the latent uh, of the APIs became, became, became a better. lot better than yeah. what it was previously. Awesome, and then I can imagine as well with the caching. That's uh, an interesting use case because now if you're returning a response from the cache closer mm-hmm. to the application that's consuming the APIs you could potentially be servicing more transactions because you're not necessarily hitting the back-end system. So, yeah, that's actually a great point. So mm. one of the challenges uh, they had was, so the back-end, when the mm. e-commerce engine was built and the whole infrastructure was built, that was built thinking of of the world with a browser-first approach, mm. web world which was like, oh, this can have, let's say, whatever, X number of calls simultaneously, yeah. 10X number of calls a day, whatnot. They did not think inherently the mobile-first approach mm. and the scale which mobile brings in, yeah. right? So, and, and they had severe problems with a lot of outages at various mm. different times, slow performance and things like that, especially during peak hours. Um, they had all of, all of that, right? So as they were able to cache, mm. Um, in Apogee, we're using the L1 and L2 layer, um, a lot of those performance worries, at least for some of those services mm. like uh, shopping, uh, sorry, uh, like product catalogs and all, yeah. um, those were drastically reduced. Yeah, Absolutely. I can imagine in today's world, even like with Google Assistant, yeah. like Google Homes, yeah, yeah, that's another avenue, another channel that exactly. is blowing up. No one, no yeah. one thought of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those avenues like five years back. Yeah. So in, in this particular diagram, in the final state. There's an interesting thing here where you are actually operate. The customer is actually operating in both Google Cloud and in their own traditional data center. Uh, can you share with us some of the? Yeah. So, that? so uh, what happened is um, at the end of the day, they decided that they will migrate and uh, rewrite and whatnot most of the applications in cloud, but uh, they were not going to rewrite shopping cart. The shopping cart, they're going to maintain in the existing e-commerce solution on-prem because it is a very complex piece of software and they did not see any business value by rewriting it. So uh, as they were migrating, and we talked about in the previous slides, Avigy was the layer behind which they migrated. But not only that, Avigy was the layer which created the hybrid at the final state, mm-hmm. right? When So their final steady state will be they have their shopping cart application on-prem and they have all the other applications as microservices and whatnot in GCP. And then Avigy sits in front, which then uh, routes traffic to either GCP or to shopping cart based on um, uh, based on a different logic put inside Avigy. So this is actually Avigy helping in creating a hybrid state between on-prem and cloud mm. using an API-first approach. So normally when you think of hybrid, Customers start thinking in terms of, oh, I need to do, uh, I need to set up a VPN, I need to set up a VPC, I need to uh, do set up an interconnect, and all those kind of things to do hybrid. Yes, that may be true in some scenarios. In other scenarios, if you do an API first uh, paradigm, if you do an API first design for your applications, you can do a hybrid like this. And this is something we actually see um, customers do quite often, not only just in one scenario. We have many, many customers who are doing. Uh, this kind of hybrid uh, deployments. That that that's a uh, amazing story. Yeah. Um, I believe this was actually done in a quite a short period of time as well. Um, yeah, I mean uh, the overall. I don't. I honestly don't have the whole uh, time frame in mind. But the initial thing, uh, the initial uh, proof of concept, the initial first migration of the application and whatnot, was achieved within just a few months. Mm-hmm. Now. 
you know, as you can imagine, there are all these different pieces that needs to be moved, that needs to be rewritten yeah. and tested and run. So that so that's a I mean, I wouldn't trivialize it. That that's a pretty decent project. Mm-hmm. But to prove out this concept and to see if we can take like one service out and rewrite it, run it on Google Kubernetes engine, plug that to Apigee, yeah. and then expose a set of APIs, uh, a coherent set of APIs to all the client applications. Mm-hmm. That was done in actually a very short period of time, in like a couple of months. I think yeah. it's like a month, a little more than a month. And that actually amazed the customer. They did not expect. Yeah. Um, I mean, not meaning to trivialize it, but I'm just, I, I guess the question is, how much longer would it have taken? How I mean, they, they didn't been, do this yeah. for like yeah. so many years. I yeah. mean, they were they had this e-commerce, mm-hmm. this on-prem monolith application for so many years. They couldn't do it. Yeah. I mean, it's not that they just, it was the first time they thought about doing this. They have been thinking about doing this for a while because they had all these challenges for a while. Mm. So, I mean, without having this layer as Apigee, mm-hmm. uh, Apigee at, at that layer, they couldn't even, they couldn't even achieve that. They couldn't that. achieve it. Yeah. 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 They couldn't even think about taking how on to do task. it yeah. yeah amazing all right um thank you for sharing that with us yeah Sarah. absolutely so with that we're going to actually bring it up to a q a session now yep. um so if there's any questions please feel free to speak up or you know type it in the chat channel and um you know let's open it up yeah, thank you absolutely thank you all right so we're just going to wait a couple more minutes uh as the questions come flowing through um, I can already see a couple have already come through, so just give me a minute. Okay, so we have a question here. Um, in this particular case, is Apigee running on GCP or on-premise uh, for for this uh, particular customer? Um, in this one, it was actually running on GCP, and we are managing it as a service for our customer itself. Um, naturally, Apigee is also available as a on-premise deployment, uh, so that you can actually uh, choose to deploy it into your own uh, data center or into your own private cloud as well. Okay, we have another question. How do you see and suggest to users of Apigee uh, in a multi-cloud environment? So um, I'm going to try and interpret this one a little bit. So um, I guess the question is, is, how would you deploy Apigee in a multi-cloud environment? Um, Again, um, you can either choose to use Apigee as a service where Apigee Google would actually then uh, provision you an instance and then we would then manage and operate that instance for you. Now, uh, you also have the ability to then uh, also choose to use the on-premise deployment uh, to deploy into your own uh, data center or into your own private cloud and then have that uh, manage your API calls and mediate and broker between the two environments or multiple environments. Questions are flowing in very fast, so hopefully I can get through a lot of it. Okay, so um, will this be available post uh, post event? Yes, it will be. Uh, we will follow up with some emails around that itself. Okay, so we do have some repeat questions. Uh, so another one here is where is the API manager sitting uh, when we use cloud and on-premise? Uh, I believe that's been answered. In this particular case, we are hosting the API uh, platform itself. Okay, so we have another question here. And the question here is, customer database seems to be a common hybrid component, but complicated with firewall issues and data residency. How have you solved for this? So it, it's a number of factors. So some of those things, you know, might be an issue with moving to the cloud. So they might actually have to sit on premise. So if you uh, recall back into the actual uh, presentation itself, our customer actually left one of their components in the data center, uh, which was a shopping cart, which is actually handling the credit card payments themselves. Now, with customer database, that can also be the same case, where the database itself would need to live on premise, but you would expose out an API that we would then manage as part of the API management platform in Apigee to then provide security and control over who uses that particular API itself. We have another question here. How do you secure the connection between on-premise application and Apigee? Um, so if you're using our managed services itself, we have two options. And um, you know some customers choose to use one or the other. 
or some customers use both. And typically what they do is they use uh, IP whitelisting where we can provide you a range of IPs. And they also use mutual TLS where the certificates are provisioned to ensure that uh, only Apogee uh, you know, uh, gateways can talk to your data centers itself. Okay, we have another question. For Google Cloud, does Apigee provide adapters hooking into Google Kubernetes engine? Um, so I don't believe we have specific adapters for GKE today, um, but we have actually something called extensions, which have now uh, started uh, being leveraged to connect to GCP services. So things like uh, PubSub, BigQuery, uh, AIML are becoming uh, extensions that are becoming available and as we create more of these extensions and connectors, um, our cloud customers can then leverage to further integrate with uh, and extend the applications using uh, GCP. Okay, we do have another question. Um, can we do monetization using Apigee? Yes, we can. Um, monetization is a module uh, that sits uh, you know, as part of the platform. So we do have customers that are leveraging uh, monetization today to be able to uh, you know, open up a new digital revenue channel um, and then uh, you know, leverage that capability itself to do things like reporting all the way up to um, actually charging uh, the, the customers that actually want to leverage their APIs. Can you talk about internal usage of Apigee between internal applications and or services? Um, it's a great question. So um, internal usage and external usage are different, but at the same time, it is actually quite similar in that developers, you know, whether they're internal or external, want to have similar sub experiences between uh, in actually accessing APIs. So if you have a look at you know what's available out in the market today, there's always a developer.company.com where APIs are published for people to uh, discover and understand, and I'll subsequently also be able to test with those APIs immediately. Uh, they also want to be able to do things like self-service where they can request for access to, to the APIs and have it automatically generate you a API key for, say, a sandbox environment itself. Okay. Is there an Apigee certification program? Uh, absolutely. So we offer courses on Coursera, and um, that also gives you a level of certification. Uh, we do have a more extensive certification program. Uh, feel free to reach out to Apigee. Uh, to find out more details about it. Okay, uh, do we have documentation on this kind of setup? If you head over to our documentation page, um, you know, we do have the on-premise uh, documentation which talks about setting up Apigee on-premise. In this particular case, it, it was a cloud uh, managed service and it becomes more of a configuration rather than a, um, than a, you know, than a complete setup itself. Do we have integration with Kubernetes and Istio? Um, great question. So for folks that don't know, uh, Kubernetes is an orchestration engine, and recently there was a, a new project that has come up um, called Istio. Istio is what we call a service mesh um, uh, tool, which helps you manage your microservices within something like the Kubernetes infrastructure. Now, Apigee itself has a uh, integration with Istio where you can, as you can imagine, you have tons of these microservices within your Kubernetes uh, infrastructure, but you also want to be able to then manage some of these services as APIs. So as part of the Istio uh, extension capabilities, we have built an adapter between Istio and Apigee where you can take some of those uh, microservices and actually manage them through the management platform uh, within Apigee itself. Uh, for more details, uh, just do a uh, ha go, go to our Apigee documentation site, and there is an Istio section specific to that as well. How to monetize products. So Apigee is a complete API management platform, and as part of that, we do have a monetization module. So you can actually create uh, what we call different rate plans against different API products. Uh, these products can then be something that you make publicly available or you push towards uh, specific consumers. Uh, they can be defined as, you know, as simple as a bucket where a consumer would need to pay a monthly charge or, you know, you can come up with more, um, you know, exotic sort of plans where perhaps it's tiered 
where you know the first uh, tier they would pay X amount, and then you know once they exceed exceed a certain amount of uh, calls, they would then be charged less or more, depending on what type of model that you're trying to do. The question is: This specific to just retail organizations, or is this something you you are seeing across all industries and verticals? That's a great question, and it is across all industries and verticals. Um, you know, retail is something that we see a lot happening, but naturally across financial and health services as well, uh, they are getting more and more comfortable uh, with cloud, and therefore they're actually starting to leverage, uh, you know, Apogee as a platform to help them move and modernize uh, into the cloud. And before, and just something else um, I was uh, told to, to actually push, I kind of forgot, is um, as part of today's webcast, we are actually uh, you know, selecting three uh, webcast attendees and actually giving them uh, next passes. So next is Google Cloud's annual three-day conference. Um, it's gonna be hosted in San Francisco, which takes place on April, the 9th to the 11th this year. Um, so our team itself will be contacting uh, three of our lucky winners by early next week and um, you know, giving them the passes. So keep an eye out on your emails itself. How does this help in traffic management? Um, so Apogee, um, as a complete API management platform, has you know a number of policies that actually help you with traffic management. So things like quota uh, are available, and also um, you know, where you can actually define things like you know x number of calls per month, per day, per minute. It's up to you what you want to define. We also do have things like spike arrest, which helps you smooth out your traffic. So kind of think of it as a way to prevent uh, DDoS calls into, into your uh, platform. We also have uh, things that can actually improve performance. So things like caching are available as part of the, the policies to actually allow you to define what your keys are. And then if a request comes in with the same, um, you know, same request, same key, Apogee itself can serve the traffic out uh, into uh, it back 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 into the API consumer itself, thereby avoiding having to go all the way back up uh, to the backend system to retrieve. Do you normally need a service mesh like Istio if your microservices are on PCF? No. So Istio is is a new way of managing um, microservices in a mesh. Um, we have a ton of customers that have built microservices on PCF, and actually PCF or Pivotal is a uh, partner of ours, and we have built integrations between our platforms to ensure that as you're building our microservices and deploying them onto, um, onto PCF, you can also leverage Apogee to provision what we call an edge micro gateway or even use their full-blown edge proxy to, to secure those microservices itself check out our documentation page uh, for more details. All right, so we do have a question here. Uh, do we have quick labs to try out some concepts and labs on SDL, GKE, and more? Uh, we, we actually run uh, these API jams um, quite often, so keep your eye out on the uh, events page for the next API jam, which also can include these uh, components as well. Uh, from there, you can actually play with it for free. Can Apigee help in versioning of the API? Absolutely. So there are different ways of versioning APIs. Uh, the one that we see most common is actually through uh, you know, putting the you know, V1 or V2 in the URL, uh, or URI, I should say. Um, and that gives you the ability to then deploy multiple uh, versions of the same uh, API as well. Internally, within Apigee, you also have the ability to leverage something called revisions where we keep a copy of your previous deployment of an API proxy, uh, which gives you an ability to then uh, roll forward, roll backwards as you need. Okay, what is the adoption rate for Istio with Apigee as of today? Do you have customers moving to a service mesh? So we certainly have customers that are leveraging things like uh, Kubernetes, and then naturally they're looking at Istio as well. There are a small subset of, of our customers that are using Istio in, in uh, production, but uh, they are somewhat more uh, limited because at the rate, uh, at the current stage, Istio is fairly new, um, but 
what every one of our customers are doing, especially if they're Kubernetes uh, adopters, is they're actually now um, experimenting and making sure that they're keeping um, you know, in sync with what's happening with, with Istio, uh, what's happening with Istio and Apogee, and you know, service meshes in, in general. Um, I think we are going to be coming up uh, to the end of this session itself. So, um, you know, with that, I would kind of like to thank you all for attending today's uh, event. Um, we will answer your questions in the chat channel. Um, but uh, let me just promote our next event itself. So, um, we run these events, uh, you know, by bi monthly. So, our next event is going to be around. Um, understanding, you know, how developers are today's kings, king makers, and we have Anand Jingram from Abaji who will be delivering the session on how this trend is not only growing, but how to actually create an ecosystem around your developers uh, with an API-centric mindset, uh, thereby kind of like in encouraging more and more of your developers to actually leverage the power of APIs itself. Okay, and then lastly. Um, if you are not a current Apigee customer, or if you're just um, you know, exploring the market itself, uh, please feel free to actually sign up for a free trial on our platform. Uh, we offer a ton of documentation. We offer a ton of uh, videos as well on YouTube for you to be able to understand how you can actually leverage uh, Apigee to um, you know, manage your API program itself. And then with that, thank you very much, and have a good day.